Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. Hi, I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. This evening's edition will host legislative issues with Jim Parisi, where we bring the legislature into your living room. We hope you enjoy this edition of Legislative Issues and Labor Vision. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision, where we bring the General Assembly right into your living room. My name is James Parisi. I'm a field representative with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and I am your host this evening. Today we continue our series of discussions post-session. Uh, the 2015 General Assembly session is now behind us, and we're talking to several different guests about different issues and today we're going to talk about a real interesting issue on the tip minimum wage with Senator Gail Golden. Senator, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So before we talked about the tip minimum wage issue, a legislative success for you, I just wanted to remind our viewers that we had you on the show uh, about a year and a half ago talking about the, um, or even less than that, talking about the temporary caregiver insurance legislation that you put in where you expanded the ability of workers to, who use TDI to be able to use it to care for individuals um, uh, on a short, short term basis. So why don't you uh, take a minute and talk about um, how that bill has been working out and are there, and I know there's some recent federal developments, you could let our viewers know about that as well. Sure. So it, um so in 2013, the uh, legislature passed and uh, then Governor Chafee signed into law uh, the creation of temporary caregiver insurance, which expanded our temporary disability insurance program uh, in Rhode Island, which we've had, uh, workforces had in Rhode Island since 1942. We were the first in the country to do that. And we were the third in the country to expand that leave to create paid family leave so that people can take time off to care for a seriously ill loved one or welcome a new child into their home through birth, adoption, or foster care. Um, California and New Jersey had, were the two states that had done it before us, and our bill was modeled off of their legislation and also their uh, learning from their experiences of what, what worked well and, and what we could do better in the state. Um, and so one of the unique um, aspects of the Rhode Island law is that we have job protection. So that means if you take this four weeks of time off um, because you need it, you are certain that your job will be there when you get back. And that is critically important because certainly when you're going through um, a life crisis in particular, you want to know that you have the money in your pocket to be able to pay the bills and know that you won't lose your job at the end of it. So, you know, I'm really pleased with that. It has been very successful program. Uh, we saw in the first year several thousand families were uh, used the program uh, predominantly for caregiving of a new child leave, um, and we sometimes refer to that as bonding leave, um, to care for a new child in their home. But a good chunk of people also used it to take care of a seriously a loved one. And we certainly know with the aging population in Rhode Island, um, that can be a, a, a very stressful time and it's critically important that be able, people be able to take that time out of work um, to be able to afford it and take that time and return to their workplace. So it has been great. There has been a team at University of Rhode Island um, who have been working with the Department of Labor and Training uh, to do some pretty extensive research on what the benefits have been um, in the, just looking at the first year benefits and also helping DLT understand how to improve systems because there's you know always room for improving mm -hmm. how the process is gonna work. Sure. Um, and that has been great. And, the, um, and that was funded through a federal grant from the U.S. Department of Labor. And yesterday, the U.S. Department of Labor announced that we uh, are the only 
place in the country to re receive second year funding of that, which I'm really excited about. Mm -hmm. It will allow us to do additional um, piloting of outreach because what the evaluators found was that there were certain groups of people who were less likely to know that they had this leave. Um, and we want to make sure everybody knows it. You pay for it, so you should be able to use it if you need it. We want people to know it exists. Um, so in order to do some outreach and then also to look at ways that we can expand the benefits, um, either additional hours, add in, or additional weeks, um, add in um, who else it can cover. Um, and so we're really excited about that. Because it's paid for by the workers through a payroll deduction, people probably forget that they even contribute to their disability insurance program. And, and uh, I could certainly see why an education component would be necessary because if people don't know about a benefit, they're not going to take advantage of it. But uh, everyone needs to know that it's the workers, it's not the employer or the state, it's the workers who are paying for this benefit. Absolutely. It's fully funded by working people in Rhode Island. And so you're paying for that that benefit, and yet um, at the same time, it's, it's a little box on your paycheck in the corner beside all the mm -hmm. other little boxes, and people kind of forget that that's what that money goes for. Um, and because this is a new program of expanding on the paid family leave, part of it. We want to make sure people understand how and when to use that and how to access it. Have you heard from legislators in other states who are taking a look at what you've done here in Rhode Island? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, there uh, across the country yesterday when the U.S. Department of Labor announced um, those grants, I believe they had 17 states apply for funding to look at how to create paid family leave in their states. Um, they awarded eight grants. But there's clearly a, a growing interest across our country. Um, you know, when the president was here in October of last year, yeah, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> a year ago, <laughs> uh, you know, he came to Rhode Island to talk about paid family leave and say, look, this is time. It's not an if question. This is a when question. And this was a, a really a kickoff on behalf of the uh, the White House and their administration to figure out how the way we can make states um, make it more possible, make it possible for more states to be able to create paid family leave. And it would be nice if the federal government took on this issue. I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm always hopeful that you know this issue may uh, seep itself into our upcoming presidential election. I'm hopeful too. I mean, we've certainly seen uh, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders have talked about it. Um, you know, I think it is something that resonates with people across political lines. Uh, you know needing to take care of somebody else knows no political boundary. Uh, it's just the way our lives exist now and in terms of our work lives and our our home lives. And, you know, people really care about this issue and it knows no political boundaries in every other country around the world. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm really hopeful that we'll be able to see change. There certainly is legislation introduced in, um, in Congress. Uh, Congresswoman DeLauro from Connecticut um, has really been leading the charge as well as Senator Gillibrand in New York um, to introduce the Family Act, which is modeled off of California, New Jersey, and Rhode Island's mm -hmm. programs. Um, but as we know, most of the action is happening in the states now, and so that may be the way we get this done for most people. Which is a good segue for me because the, the other issue we're going to talk about is the minimum wage, and there's been no movement on increasing the federal minimum wage, which is um, $7.25. There has been no movement um, for a long time. So this state, like a lot of other states, has gone ahead and increased their minimum wage over time. Now, the general minimum wage for, uh, for Rhode Island is going up to $9.60 an hour January. But there's another aspect of our minimum wage law that you worked on this year. and, and there's a good chance a lot of our viewers don't know about it. So why don't you start by just explaining to our viewers how this um, minimum wage for tip workers works. I, you know, a lot of people call it a sub-minimum wage or a tipped minimum wage. Some people call it a tip credit. But essentially the way our law exists um, is that we have a minimum wage and it will be $9.60 is our coming up 
uh, raise. Um, but we have a we have a minimum wage, and then we have something a tip minimum wage, which is two dollars and eighty nine cents an hour. And that means that if you work in a tipped industry, and that's predominantly restaurant workers, but there are other tipped workers in our state your employer is required to pay you that tipped minimum wage as long as your tips um, add up to the minimum wage in theory. So in theory, you make the minimum wage by uh, people who are tipping you directly paying you. It is a, an, it's an unusual way of getting paid. Uh, you know, most of us expect that the, um, tip we are living, leaving is truly a gratuity. It's a thank you for good service, as opposed to the way that the worker is making their day-to-day -day salary. And the tip minimum wage, or sub-minimum wage, as I used to often call it, is, is low. It's currently $2.89 an hour. No one can live on that. <laughs> exactly, and, it, and we've had it uh, there since for 20 years. Uh, you know, one of the things that amazed me was even in thinking about that, you think 20 years. Well, the minimum wage, when we had a tip minimum wage of 289, was 445 an hour. So we have really been pushing, um, and and I think it's great. We've been raising that the top mm -hmm. minimum wage, the one that everybody usually talks about, um, gradually over the past several years. And while that certainly is advantageous, advantageous for many workers in the state, we've left out a whole group of people um, by only raising the top. And in some ways, that leaves them even more vulnerable to um, to, to really being affected um, in a negative way by, um, by sexual harassment, by their uh, employers taking advantage of them. A whole host of, of power dynamics really get into play here because what we're saying is instead of going from 289 to 445, so that's, I'm not doing the math there. <laughs> A dollar and sixty cents mm -hmm. or something, you know. In tips, I mean that's a whole totally different thing in expecting somebody to make a dollar sixty an hour in tips versus making uh, seven dollars an hour in tips. So yeah. we're we're really addressing an inequity when we raise the tip minimum wage. So what was the legislation that you first introduced? You know, before we talk about what what passed, what was what was your initial goal when you? Uh, made a foray into this issue this session? The bill that I introduced, which actually had um, uh, many, many co-sponsors in both the Senate and the House, um, either, that bill would have gradually raised the tip minimum wage over the course of the next few years or so um, in order to eliminate the tip minimum wage and so that everybody would be a minimum, any, anybody who works at the minimum wage works at the same minimum wage. Um, you know, there are uh, I believe seven states that have that have eliminated the tip minimum wage and only have a minimum wage for all workers, restaurant workers, everybody. Um, and people still make tips and make plenty of money mm -hmm. um, as tip workers make plenty of tips off of those. So, you know, that was really our goal when we set about this legislation mm -hmm. was to address this inequity. Um, try and eliminate some of the ways that people are, are kept in poverty because of the tip minimum wage um, and uh, and create a more equitable system. And you ran into some opposition. I, I know that the restaurant industry uh, itself uh, was organized in opposition to it. And, and at the end of the day, there was some legislative compromise. Uh, let our viewers know what what happened with the bill this year? Um, so the compromise is um, the wage is being increased by a dollar over the course of two years. So it's going 50, up 50 cents and then 50 cents the next year. Um, you know, that's obviously any raise, when you wait 20 years, any raise is certainly a good first step. Um, and I have been told that this is the first time in Rhode Island that we've even addressed a minimum wage bill of any sort over the course of two years. So I do feel that that is um, a very strong first step. I think that there is so much left to be done um, because it's not only just about wages for uh, particularly a tipped workforce you know, and, and a low income workforce to begin with. But 
I am happy that we have at least seen this increase, we'll see this increase of a dollar over the course of the two, mm -hmm. two years. And I know it's not solely um, restaurant workers, but as you said, it's primarily or predominantly uh, restaurant workers mm -hmm. impacted by this. Um, ha has your legislation generated some discussion about how we pay people in the first place? I know other other places, other countries don't, you know, workers in that industry don't rely on tips for a living. They, they get a living wage initially. Exactly. And, and, you know, even in states where we do, like California, where you know, they don't have um, a tipped minimum wage and people are still tipping them, that means that they're putting this workforce into a living wage and, and recognizing that there's professionalism in the industry. I think by, um, by making it solely based on tips, we've really diminished and devalued the work of, the, of restaurant workers in particular, which is problematic. Um, and you're right, there are many countries where the reason people are surprised if you leave a tip, as Americans do when they're traveling um, overseas, is because they are paid living wages and receive health care benefits and are considered a professional workforce and are treated as such. Um, so certainly, yes, there have been discussions about that. Across our country, there have been um, restaurants who have eliminated tipping altogether. Um, there's a restaurant, I think, in Philadelphia that announced that they were, they collectively decided that their whole workforce, everybody would make $35,000 a year in the restaurant and get benefits in retirement. And, you know, that has meant that the, they have removed um, a lot of disparity about who's going to get what shift or um, concerns about what the, re what the kitchen staff is making versus the front right. staff. Um, so there are many different ways that we could address this issue, but it's certainly something that we need to talk about. And it looks like your legislation really initiated a discussion. This this legislation this year that passed isn't the, isn't the end of the discussion, is it? No, it certainly isn't. And I look forward to having um, more conversations. You know, I know that uh, many people have thanked me for introducing this legislation because it's been meaningful to them. Um, many people who have worked in the restaurant industry at some time in their career are also really appreciative, even if they're no longer in that um, work Force, but it's it's a way that I think we're having a conversation about how do we create a better work environment and how do we address income inequality in Rhode Island? Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, I'd like to congratulate you for having um, successfully shepherded through two significant pieces of worker-related legislation in just three years uh, of ser time served in the General Assembly. Thank you. Yeah, and, uh, and we look forward to a future show, perhaps we can have you come back and we can talk about different other uh, other different aspects of what's going on with uh, tipped uh, workers and, and what kind of legislation would address it. Great, thank you. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Fishing. Hello, I'm Jerry O'Neill. I want to thank Maureen for that lovely introduction. I'd like to get a copy of that if I can keep it. <laughs> I want to thank all my friends from Council 94 for being here today, although I have a little bad news. I know President Downey had told you you'd get overtime for coming here tonight, but <laughs> I'm sorry, that, that, sorry, that's not going to happen. Although President Downey did call the governor, see if he can get comp time, so that's it. <laughs> I'd like to say uh, thank you for most of my staff being here tonight. You will not be disciplined tomorrow, but, so, uh, <laughs> but <clears throat> since this is a uh, historical society, I thought I would share a few of the uh, cogent facts of my history. I believe all labor advocates have a strong sense of fairness and justice. I believe I got mine from my parents. My father was born in Ireland in 1918. His father died later that year, when he was only nine months old. My grandfather, James, was a fighter for the Irish independence movement. My grandmother... <laughs> my grandmother would tell us stories about these black and tans. They were not regular British troops, but they were like an army hired by the British army to go in and terrorize uh, Irish citizens. They would come into my grandmother's house and my father's house and stick bayonets into the walls looking for my grandfather. They did this even to a couple years after he had died. 
So my grandmother growing up was never very thought much of the British government. <laughs> my mother was a little different in that she was born into a family that had uh, gathered considerable wealth during the 1920s. Uh, they had a chauffeur, a maid, and they had a 13-room house in Scarsdale, New York. My grandfather had invested in aluminum and was worth over $2 million in two, uh, 1928. However, after the stock market crashed, they lost everything. They went from the 13-room house to a three-room apartment, and my mother had to quit high school to, to help support the family. So I think I got a lot, a lot of my experiences and developed a sense of fairness and justice from them. I graduated from Our Lady of Providence High School in 1970, several years before our other honorees, Frank and Matt, graduated. I did not, Frank was behind me by a couple of years. I did not see much of Frank in high school, only when I would pass the detention room and he was usually in there. <laughs> I can't say that I saw Matt there because I think he came after I had already graduated. <laughs> but there must be something about Catholic high school boys drawn to the labor movement. Uh, <laughs> President Downey was also another Catholic, Catholic high school boy, as were my late friends Joe Peckham and Dan Martin. I graduated in, at RIC in 1976 with a DA, BA in social welfare. While attending RIC, I managed to take some time off and hitchhiked across the country three separate times, which kind of gave me a, a good idea of how big and diverse this country is. In 1977, as Maureen alluded to, I started as an institutional attendant at Ladd School and almost immediately became a union steward. And that began my relationship with AFSCME, which is now 38 years. AFSCME has been a big part of my life and really helped me to be as successful as I am. In 1980, I started law school uh, at nights in Boston. Our master contract provided for uh, 35 hour employees, which I was, I was a teacher aide, could work overtime uh, seven, and get seven and a half hours of comp time a week. Working full time and going to law school was quite difficult, so I could do the overtime on days I didn't go to school, and then I could take extra days off to study. This was very beneficial to my uh, successfully completing law school. However, in 1983, I started my third year in law school, the state, for some reason, as they will often do, decided that even though the contract says you can do it, we're not gonna let you do it. So we filed a grievance, and we, won we lost at the first level, but we won at the, the third level, and I again received my right to receive comp time. So the master contract and Local 1293 were very helpful in my success, successfully passing law school. And we still have that language in the contract today. In Local 1293 at Ladd Center, I learned the importance of working together with other employees for everybody's benefit. We had some great union people who fought locally and statewide for better pay and benefits for, for everybody. People like Dan Martin, Maureen Martin, Jerry Clancy, John Vars, Jack Palazzo, and Joe Idavaya. They were very great union leaders, and it, it takes a, a lot of good union leaders to be successful, I believe. But now I think we need dedicated leaders as much as ever, because what's going on in the real world is that the, the wealthy right wing is attempting to take away the American dream for the average citizen or the, the average uh, employee. Public sector employees are under attack by these same people, but also were under attack by the United States Supreme Court in the decisions they've made recently and in that they, we expect them to make next year. So we are in a fierce battle, and it's a continuing battle, and we have to remain strong, and I think gatherings like this help us remain strong and understand how important it is, because some of our people we represent don't understand that they could lose a lot of the things that they have today. I, 
I think it's time for me to stop talking because Maureen had told me when I spoke to her that the honoree who speaks the least amount of time gets a new car. <laughs> is, that, is that still correct? A matchbox. Yeah. I do, I do want to thank the Labor History Society for this award. It's very important to me. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank again all my uh, co-workers for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Great job. And, and in addition to uh, the award we, we provided, uh, there are also um, uh, certificates from uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse for Jerry and the other, uh, the other honorees. Please, uh, please welcome to the podium for the second uh, honoree, Rhode Island Labor History Society founder, labor leader, union member, and rosé wine drinker, Scott Malloy. <laughs> Before I get to Matt Boda, I want to say thank you to Jim Parisi, who stepped into a tough position and in a volunteer way has taken over the society and done so much of the work without ever complaining, without ever a nasty word from him, our president. And the fact that he gives me homemade wine has nothing to do with that. Uh, <laughs> you know, one of the great uh, academic challenges that teachers and professors uh, face in our career is when you look out in your class after a couple of weeks each semester, and you look over to your left and there's a very bright young woman over there, and over to your right a, a smart young man, and you come to the realization that there's people out there that are smarter than you. <laughs> and you've got two ways to go. You either resist or you assist. Now, I know a few professors who resist. They try to keep those people down so that no one will ever suspect that they're smarter than the teacher. <laughs> but I think most of the faculty that I've dealt with all my life try to assist those people who are so smart that they are on a trajectory to greater achievement. And all we want to do is help them along to go as far as they can to set an example. Yeah. Now, thank goodness in my uh, uh, situation, there weren't many students in that position. But <laughs> at, the, uh, at the Schmidt, at the Schmidt Labor Research Center, I gotta tell you, boy, the, the students there are a cut above, uh, regardless of where you go. And uh, that's true tonight uh, for Matt Boda. It's true for Bob Walsh, Lexi, and a whole bunch of other people who are here uh, that I really enjoyed uh, helping them along because I knew they were indeed smarter than I was. And they were so arrogant sometimes. <laughs> They would challenge me to put questions on the exam that I couldn't answer. <laughs> and if anyone's ever taken a class with me, know I have a little matching pot that's only worth 20 points. Match 10 on the left, 10 on the right. Mickey Mouse. But I make sure everyone does the reading. Well, they used to bust my chops about that all the time. I gotta get those 10 right. I said, all right, you want it tough, you'll get it tough. <laughs> Big Bill Haywood of the Western Federation of Miners wore a patch in his eye. Was it the left or the right? Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.
Good morning, everyone. Morning. Happy Labor Day. God bless the labor movement for the Labor Day and creating a middle class for this country. My name is James Parisi. I'm a field representative with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals. And more importantly today, I'm president of the Rhode Island Labor History Society. Thank you for coming to our annual Labor Day event held here in Central Falls. We're a labor history society, so it's probably no surprise that, that we hold an annual event in a cemetery. Uh, <laughs> but a cemetery isn't just for people uh, laying flat on the ground, but it's for those of us who are standing on our own two feet to remember what the people laying on the ground went through. We picked this site primarily because this is a site of a famous battle between the National Guard and, and striking workers and community members in this area during a 1934 textile strike. And the Labor History Society put up a memorial behind me, uh, memorializing the, the two who died here and as well as two who died in the city of Woonsocket during that violent times in 1934. We also picked this spot because we are a stone's throw away from a cemetery stone uh, just to my right uh, that still has the two bullet holes from the bullets fired by the National Guardsmen after they had set up, um, set up uh, their guns on top of a factory uh, just down the hill. The Labor History Society is an organization of about 450 members dedicated to keeping labor history alive. And we think it's most important that we celebrate Labor Day just not by enjoying a three-day weekend, a last stop at the beach, um, you know, maybe uh, the beginning of the football season, all important things in my book, uh, but also because we need to remember the people who led struggles that provide for us the kind of standard of living we enjoy today. There are struggles going on right now. And in a few minutes, we're going to hear from Ryan McIntyre about events of 100 years ago. But as we stand here today or sit here today, uh, we know that there are firefighters in Providence who are struggling to maintain a voice at the bargaining table over what their work schedule looks like. We know there are teachers in Newport who are working to rule for failure to reach an agreement. I saw in yesterday's Providence Journal that the... Um, that a health care center is putting up a notice, a help wanted ad, because they're preparing for labor dispute in a, in a nursing home, as well as SEIU members who are uh, special educators who are trying to get a first contract at the Grodin Center. I, I'm mindful that uh, we have a whole host of people who are undergoing struggles today, and that's what the Labor History Society tries to do, to talk about the past and make connections with the uh, struggles that are going on today. And we have a strong membership because we think that's important. And your attendance here today uh, shows me that it's important to you as well. Uh, I'd like to particularly thank uh, Mayor Jim Diosa from Central Falls for joining us today. <laughs> Mayor, you get extra credit showing up here on a non-election year. So. We've been through a lot within the, uh, within the labor movement, but we're, we are all about perseverance. And some of the things that Ryan's going to talk about um, didn't necessarily bear fruit on day one, but in the long run, they, they bore fruit. And that's what the labor movement is about. It's about being a voice for people who work for a living, being a voice for them so that they could better the, uh, their standard of living, not only for themselves, not only for their families, but for the whole community at large. And as we've seen the decline of the number of union members in this country, we've seen a match decline in the standard of living uh, for middle class and working class people, as we've seen uh, probably the greatest enhancement of wealth by the, the rich and mighty in this country, uh, unprecedented. Uh, and it's all because of uh, a lack of a voice on enough workers. But organizing continues. Some unions continue to grow, organize new members. Uh, I, I'm particularly mindful of the Restaurant Opportunity Center, and Mike Arujo is here, who's done a terrific job organizing a group of unorganized workers to better themselves, better their standard of living, and be a real voice for people who really didn't have a voice without an organization. Now I'd like to bring to the podium Ryan McIntyre, who's a 
teacher of history as well as student of history, uh, but more importantly, he's a member of our board of the Rhode Island Labor History Society to give our address today. Ryan. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, brothers and sisters, before I begin, uh, let us take a moment and bow our heads uh, for a brief moment of silence for those who have fallen before us uh, to help make not only the world a better place, but our families also a better place also. We gather here today, this Labor Day in 2015, in this cemetery to celebrate the noble contributions of the men and women who came before us, their sacrifices, trials, triumphs, and tribulations we must study to help us pave our way forward as a society. The Rhode Island Labor History Society popularizes the history of blue collar men and women that fought together for democracy in the workplace, thus bringing about a better life for our families and their families. Rhode Island was the first urbanized and industrialized state in the country, so there is a rich and deep history to study from. The American labor movement, and in particular the Rhode Island labor movement, had a profound, prestigious, and prolific effect on the way in which we live and work today. In particular, 1915, 100 years ago, organized labor was on the move in Rhode Island. According to the State Commissioner of Labor Affairs report, 26 strikes took place in this state, which is less than 50 by 50 miles, affecting thousands of Rhode Islanders and working families. A cross-section of workers from different religious groups, tongues, languages, and belief systems in all walks of life took part in the walkouts that year in Rhode Island. Painters in Woonsocket, stucco workers, weavers and webbers in Pawtucket, knitters and boilermakers in East Providence, spinners in Boroughville, laborers and the mighty machinists in Providence. By September 1915, labor conflict had been permeating in Rhode Island and it all led to the most important industrial sh uh, strike, the Super Bowl of strikes, if you will, that year at Brown and Sharp. Now the strike at Brown and Sharp Manufacturing Company took place at a time in America of financial instability, arrival of new immigrants from Southern Europe, and the outbreak of World War. Towards the end of September of that year, machinists at the Brown and Sharp Complex, century located on Promenade Street, had been in a labor dispute over wages, working conditions, union recognition, and the eight-hour workday. The workers' schedule was 55 hours per week, working 10 days, working 10 hours, <laughs> working 10-hour daily for five days and a five-hour period on Saturday. That's 55 hours. The workers at Brown and Sharp decided to strike and demonstrate their unhappiness with the decision of management to refuse to allow a framework for cooperation with the workers. The International Union of Machinists understood the importance of the fight for the eight-hour workday and, of course, democracy in the workplace. In addition, the Machinists Union understood how a strong show of force at the massive complex like Brown and Shop would dramatically strengthen their cause and could catapult the eight-hour movement forward in a big way. During the course of several weeks, thousands of workers, both skilled and unskilled, struck in and around Providence in solidarity with the machinists. A labor union leader was quoted as saying, if strike it is, then by God, I'm with you, and get in there and clean the damn place out. Management, and in particular Mr. Shop himself, responded by sending out a letter to all present and former employees of Brown and Sharp. Shop's response did not contain one shred of support for his workers or their grievances against his company and referred to the 55-hour work week as fair. <laughs> In fact, Brown and Sharp made all workers reapply after they had been discharged in wake of the strike. The skilled and unskilled workers eventually returned to work sometime in October and would not win the right for uh, a union shop until the 1940s during World War II. It's important to understand that during times of national war uh, mobilization, the government makes every effort for labor peace and makes significant efforts to promote and encourage labor peace to keep the war effort moving strong. Today, the remnants of that complex, which was well built over 100 years ago on Promenade Street, has been extensively modernized and renovated and is home to luxury lofts. 
Many of the 1915 labor strikes had been unsuccessful, and the demands of the strikers largely unmet. But in the following three years, 214 more strikes broke out, indicating working Rhode Islanders' refusal to be denied democracy in the workplace after the defeat at Brown and Chop. During that era, some notable strikes took place affecting spinners in West Warwick, the streetcar workers in Providence, skilled craft workers and textile workers in both the Patuxet and the Blackstone Valley regions. A big strike took place in North Providence at the Esmond Mill, led by the industrial workers of the world, the Wobblies as we know them. By 1919, in fact, up in Boston, police officers walked out to get a union shop and became members of organized labor. Both patriotism and unionism were in the American culture by the end of World War I, and the Rhode Island labor movement had a significant role in making that happen. The fight for the 40-hour work we continued, it would not become law and standard practice until 1938 under the Fair Labor Standards Act under President Roosevelt. An idea or working class philosophy that was driving much of this was help us get it for the boys now fighting so they won't have to go to another state to work when they return. This quote is a demonstration of the collective spirit of the day and maybe you cannot fight the foreign enemies abroad but you can hear and fight against your domestic ones. The instrumentality of the union movement is how you do it and people could feel it. Which brings me to my closing remarks. I once heard a wise man say that just as Memorial Day is a day to celebrate our victories over our foreign enemies, Labor Day is a day that we celebrate our victories over our domestic ones. In conclusion this Labor Day, may the working class of America draw strength, solidarity, and unity from events such as Brown and Sharper 1915 and the Salesville Massacre for a better life for themselves and their families. Also, we pay homage to those who lost their lives in Woodsocket during the general textile strike of 1934. We keep fighting the good fight together and alongside one another. Amen. Thank you. At this time, I would like to acknowledge the following individuals and uh, organizations for their contributions to this event and their consistent cooperation every year that we do have it here. Um, George from Asashik Cemetery Corporation for his consistent cooperation and also his ambitions to improve the site uh, for us. The entire Rhode Island Labor History Society executive board members and working Rhode Island and Rhode Island AFL-CIO for their support also. Thank you very much. MCs of this event consistently recall our, our dear friend Chuck Schwartz, who was instrumental in the formation of the Rhode Island Labor History Society, and I proudly carry on that tradition. Chuck, you're still in our thoughts and absolutely in our hearts. We lost a lioness of the labor movement recently with the passing of Pat Houlihan. Pat was a former head of the Providence Teachers Union, the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and she toiled for years with the AFT and with the AFL-CIO doing political work as well as uh, real involvement in Democratic Party politics. And I was a personal beneficiary of her generosity as well as her commitment when I was a young pup to the Rhode Island labor movement in 94. She took me under, the wing, under her wing and really helped show me the way on how things really work in this state. And there is a guide on how things really work in this state. Please take a moment and stand and join me in a moment of silence for our sister, Pat Hulan. Thank you and remain standing because we lost a few other uh, important uh, leaders of the Rhode Island labor movement this year. And please take a moment as we recall the passing of Tom Savoy and the recent passing of Bing Fogarty. Thank you all very much.
We have some new faces in the room, and I want to give a special uh, greetings to the folks in the back in front of uh, Paul Hubbard. Uh, welcome to Mike and the other folks with the Restaurant Opportunity Center, Rock United. And while I don't know if I can use the word union to describe their organization, they are an active worker organization who did a terrific job this year raising the tip minimum wage for restaurant workers. Their work is an inspiration in fighting for economic justice and we're so glad uh, they're here. And finally, um, before I get to some announcements, I'd like to take a moment and have all the members of the Rhode Island Labor History Society Executive Board stand and be recognized by everyone else in the room. Please stand up, board members. Mike Daly, IDW 99. Oh. Uh, these folks give up um, frequent Friday afternoons at 5.30, because that's when we have our meetings, folks. Um, some traditions I, even I can't break. Uh, but uh, they do great work and all volunteer board to get a lot of things done. I want to make a few quick uh, announcements uh, before we go on to our honorees. Um, I just want to make mention that uh, the Coalition of Labor Union Women recently reorganized their Rhode Island chapter and all women and men are encouraged to join and if you have any interest, uh, contact me, contact Maureen Martin, uh, you know who to contact. Our membership is strong. Um, we're, we're at about 450 members, we remain strong and consistent, but if you know folks who aren't members or if you're not members yourself, we have some uh, membership flyers downstairs at the front table. And finally, if you don't do so yet, follow us on Facebook and on Twitter, Rhode Island Labor History. On to the main event. I'd like to start by welcoming Maureen Martin to the podium, my coworker at the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, Secretary Treasurer of the Rhode Island AFL-CIO, and she's gonna uh, um, introduce our first honoree. Thank you, Jim. Good job. And um, as Jim has already talked about, Pat Houlihan and the Coalition of Labor Union Women, we have the, uh, the antique banner up here. We haven't received a new one yet, um, but she was also a founding member of um, the Coalition of Labor Union Women back in the 70s when we first started up. So um, she's been an inspiration, inspiration to me since I was, as Jim calls it, a pup. In, uh, in the labor movement. <clears throat> um, so I'm um, particularly pleased to be in front of this group of labor, labor organizers and activists and leaders. You know, I'm kind of lucky in life and in my job I get to be in front of a lot of labor folks and a lot of different venues and this is almost always my very favorite. Not to mention the fact that it's mostly all the same people at all of the, the same. <laughs> no. So you're, this really is a very friendly uh, air. And now that they have air conditioning up here, how much, how, how good is that? Yeah. yeah, so we went years without air conditioning up here. So I have the distinct pleasure in introducing Jerry O'Neill, who is the executive, the current executive director of um, Ask Me Council 94. I first met Jerry back in 1977 when he came to work where I was working at the um, state facility for people with developmental disabilities, uh, LAD Center. And him and I became active in our local union down there. But my introduction to Jerry tonight, I think, needs to start before then, sort of before the beginning, uh, with the story of how we became employed at the state institution in 1977. Jerry um, was just fresh out of college, and he knew sort of nothing about how to get a state job in the 70s, and he was well qualified, he had a college education, maybe he was overqualified at that, and had worked in a hospital, and he had a lot of things going for him, bright young guy, and uh, so he put in an application to be an institution attendant, and then he waited, and then he waited, and he called a couple times, and they said, yeah, yeah, 
And then he waited some more. And then he happened upon a gentleman called Jim Fugier, named Jim Fougier, who was the personnel administrator at LAD. And, and he talked to him about it. And, and Jim said, well, who did you call? And he said, so Jerry says, what do you mean, who did I call? I filled out an application. He said, yeah, but who did you call? You know, where's your senator, your state rep, or, you know, your, where's your, who's your local town Democratic committee chairperson? So Jerry's like, uh, I don't know, I put in an application, I'm qualified for the job, I don't know what the problem is. But he trusted what Jim said, and so he made a couple of phone calls. And then about 10 minutes later, <laughs> He got, he got a job, <laughs> lo and behold, and, and soon after he got a promotion or a transfer to be a, a teacher assistant, as they call him, a program aide at the old lad center. So uh, that was Jerry's introduction. Um, I think that um, when I heard this story from Jerry, when I talked to him about in preparation for talking tonight, and he told me the story, I remembered that um, Jim Fugier, who happens to be a friend of mine from all these years at LAD Center where I worked and was a union leader also, um, he had told me this story, not just about Jerry, but about a lot of folks. He had helped to get jobs at LAD Center. So I thought to call him and have uh, Jim Fugier and his wife, Brenda, who was another uh, local 1293 labor activist and, and officer at, lo at uh, local 1293, during the 70s, 80s, 90s, maybe until a short time ago when she went over on the dark side and became a manager. <laughs> uh, so I think it would only be appropriate to have uh, Jim and Brenda stand up and get a little shout out from the general labor community. I'll tell you what. Brenda was um, always involved in the union for about 20 or 30 years, and Jim was not. He was an administ administrator, but he did no harm to any employee at that institution and helped so many people. So we've always been very grateful about that. I was at that time sitting on the board, uh, the executive board of Local 1293, and a few of us spotted Jerry, and we said, this is our guy. <laughs> and so we knew right off the bat, just by his mannerisms and how thoughtful he was and how well he uh, assimilated into the workplace and how well respected he was by both the managers and the um, rank and file members. And we snookered him in right away. He had one foot in the door at his, on his job and we, we convinced him to be the, shops, the, the building steward in his area. Shortly after that, he became the uh, grievance chairman, grievance committee chairman, and then was sitting on the executive board. Around that time, he started to um, attend law school in Boston. He'd work all day and then catch a bus and go up to Boston and, um, and became a lawyer while he was working. He was so valuable to us as he was going through law school and, so, and helping us with dozens and dozens of grievances along the way. He was a, a great asset to the local. And so I think that he probably didn't know at that time what a long journey uh, in the labor movement he had uh, set upon by, by agreeing to become a shot of the steward in his work area. So um, I, I guess I'm supposed to give you a lot of history about he went to, you know, got in the Rhode Island Bar in 1984 and he was working part-time for Council 94 while he had his own practice down in South Kingstown where he lives with uh, his wife Elaine and his two children who have now, unbeknownst to me, grown up and moved away. I thought they were still little because I hadn't <laughs> seen them. And they're like 30 something and living away. I mean, you know how it is with all of us. We only think our own children grow up and everybody else, if you don't see them, they're still little. So he eventually, um, closed his, his private practice and became a full-time attorney, senior staff rep at Council 94, where he has represented council, the council before the state superior, state superior court, state supreme court, the state labor relations board, personnel appeals board, and in his spare time, he managed to work on hundreds of arbitration cases. Last year, by unanimous vote of the Council 94 Executive Board, Jerry was appointed to be the Executive Director of Rhode Island Council 94. So, <laughs> of 
when I asked Jerry uh, what he saw as the biggest challenge in his job going forward, he said that, well, he has to deal with all the kinds of things that come with the job, like contract negotiations during tough budget times, especially since 2008, fighting to keep people employed instead of laid off. He told me, had, he, he told me a little story about in, in Central Falls, they had to work through the privatization of the um, custodians that went from $18.50 an hour to $10.50 an hour when they privatized those services. And he most recently, they've been fighting on the proposed privatization of what they politely call outsourcing of state jobs at Rye Class and the Ellenus Slater Hospital. But he said the frustration he has and the more difficult task is just what it has always been, something we fought um, uh, uh, for it all the time at, back in the old Lad, Lad Center days. And that was getting members involved and, and helping them to understand how important it is to be politically involved. But as difficult as that challenge may be, I think that Council 94 will persevere and they have the leadership to move them forward in spite of the obstacles. Mm -hmm. I like what Council 94 President Michael Downey said in his press release when Jerry was hired as the executive director. Mike said, with Jerry's leadership, we will continue to advocate aggressively for our members and all Rhode Island workers during these challenging times. And when I met with Jerry the other day, I uh, was walking out and the office staff were all in the front room. So I stopped and asked them how it was working with Jerry as the executive director. And they said, He's fair, he's easy to talk to, he's a good listener. He's a valuable asset to this organization and we feel comfortable with him and confident that we are in good hands. And I think that's a great tribute that your employees think that. So, no further ado, let's go. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.